Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this another time together. We thank Thee for Thy Word. We thank Thee that Thou hast given us Thy Holy Spirit, who has been given to guide us into all truth. We thank Thee that Thou hast given us an understanding that we might know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So we pray that Thou hast Enlighten us, cause us to understand and believe. For we live a life that is a life lived through faith. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. We are looking at um, Galatians. We get to verse um, 22. Galatians 4.22. Um, by the way, Mary Jane, we are using Luther's commentary, Martin Luther's commentary on the book of Galatians. If you can, uh, I'll have to give you the link later on. You can get it, you can just uh, print it out. Um, it's online. You can just print it out every week. But uh, we're on page 415 of the book. For those of you who have the book, and which is uh, Galatians 4.22, which says, um, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. And furthermore, we're, we're doing two things, sort of like rubbing your stomach and patting your head. We're doing Galatians, and we're also going over the shorter catechism, which is very important. I didn't even think of, I just thought of that this week. When we decided to do the Shorter Catechism, I didn't think of the prospect of our having children and being able to teach it to our children. And basically what we're doing with the Catechism is trying to help parents understand how to teach your children the Catechism. Uh, first of all, we memorize Word Perfect, and then uh, gradually we get them to see the meaning of the questions and answers and how they relate to each other and how that it is a, a comprehensive um, teaching concerning just what the gospel is. So anyway, we're starting with um, Galatians chapter 22 and, and Martin Luther. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a servant and one by a free woman. But he which was of the servant was born after the flesh, and he which was of the free woman was born after the promise. So what is the first thing we notice? I hope you notice. Um, Jimmy, what's the first thing you notice when you read verse 22? Uh, <clears throat> it is written that Abraham had two sons, one born out of prom, I mean, that he had two sons. Right. And notice... One was this and the other was that. And that is an example of something we constantly emphasize. There you go. We constantly emphasize the antithesis. Give me an example of the antithesis. Jimmy. I mean, this is an example, not, not only, but also, but... Uh, Okay, an example of the antithesis, light and darkness. Light and death. Is, is darkness an inconsistent version of light? Kenny, what would you say? No. No. Darkness has nothing whatsoever to do with light. It's the opposite of light. Okay, so darkness and light. Give me another one, anybody. Cursing. Blessing and cursing, exactly. Is cursing an inconsistent version of blessing, Ellen? No. No. What is it? What's the relationship? <laughs> they are opposites. Complete opposites. Look at Proverbs 3.33. Read it. Ellen, why don't you read it? Proverbs 3.33. Okay. Um, 
The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but he that blesses, blesseth the habitation of the just. There it is. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but, you see, the antithesis, the contrast, he blesseth the habitation of the just. Blessing and cursing, completely antithetical. One opposite to the other. What's another one? Instance after instance after instance after instance. Love and hate. Go ahead. Love and hate. Love. Who said that? Who's talking? April? Love and hatred, exactly. Uh, so when we come to Romans 9, 13, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What we're supposed to understand by that is that God... Uh, loved Esau less than he loved Jacob, right? Is that what it means? No, no. not if you look at Malachi. Um, and so that's another instance of it. See, what's the danger? See, all of these um, antitheses, and what does the word antithesis mean? Mary Jane, you know? I didn't, I didn't. What's that? I didn't get it. Yeah, I asked what is, what does the word antithesis mean? Antithesis, like antithesis? Yeah, it means know. the opposite, okay? So two things which are opposed to one another. So we said light and darkness. Blessing and cursing, um, love and hatred, uh, etc. Uh, why is this so important? Kenny, why is this so important? Or is it? Maybe it isn't important. Well, it's, it, it's, it's uh, connected to our, it's connected to the gospel. It, it, it's uh, it's leading us to the gospel uh, to see that we are the opposite of all good, yeah. which is our first our first step to salvation. And we have here's, to see the difference between us and God. Here's what the devil wants to do: the devil, uh, the devil doesn't have a red suit, horns, and a pitchfork. What do I mean by that, Jenny? You say me? Yeah. That's two questions in a row you asked me. You know <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm making up for lost time. It means, it means he comes as an angel of light and very difficult to recognize most of the time. It's not right. all the time. Yeah. If you see somebody with a red suit, horns, and a pitchfork, you know that it is not the devil. <laughs> right? See? Uh, the hand is quicker than the eye. Uh, what we're saying is that the devil is a deceiver, which is and what he wants to do is he wants to obliterate that distinction between the truth. See, that's another one, uh, antithesis. And a, a, another example, it, they're all the same thing, the truth and the lie, right? So he wants to make the lie seem to be an inconsistent version of the truth. Right? Um, and because if he can do that, then he's totally eliminated. And, wh and what did we say? I mean, by way of review, what is the devil after? Well, what is it that he's seeking to do in all his machinations? What is he seeking to do? Remove Get Christ from the gospel. There it is. Remove Christ from Christianity. Bet your bottom dollar on it. And if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, you can see it. Um, the redefinition of total depravity is an attempt to remove Christ from Christianity. Because if man isn't completely wicked, if he, if he is not as bad as he can possibly be, then what? How does that remove Christ from the gospel? Jimmy. I mean, then he doesn't need Christ to be a savior. He can save himself. Right. He, does, he, he might need a, a psychologist. But he doesn't need a savior. 
If a man isn't uh, dead in trespasses and sins, if a man is lying on the ground, uh, Mary Jane, let me be, if a man is lying on the ground but he's not dead, then what, then what, would, you, what would you do to help him? Turn your mic on. Okay, he is dead? I said if he's not dead, if he's lying on the ground and he's not dead, what would you do to help him? Nothing. <laughs> you might resuscitate him. He might need, uh, what do you call yeah, it? He's, C just sick. he's just sick. He's not dead. Right. He might, he might need We're CPR dead. or something like that. But right. but he doesn't need to be raised from the dead. Uh, and so, but if he is dead, then uh, what kind of medicine should you give him, Ellen? There is no medicine to give him. Call the undertaker. It's not going to help him. See that? Once again, death and life. There's another one. Death and life is the difference between. A difference in kind and not degree. Does that make sense? Gary. Yeah. Yeah. It's a difference in between kind and degree. Let me, dead is let, dead let, me, let me give you this illustration. I had a Old Testament professor in seminary. Um, I learned nothing... <laughs> I learned more from this professor than I did the vast majority of all of my professors in grammar school, high school, and college and seminary, which is to say I learned one thing from him. <laughs> so I learned much more from him than I learned from anybody else. Anyway, this is what he said. He said the difference between zero and one is greater than the difference between one and and any other number. If you do the mathematical problem, one minus zero, you come up with one. And one million minus zero is a million. But he said, or well, one million minus one is nine, 999,999. But he said the difference between zero and one is, diff is greater than the difference between one and and any other number. Explain. Jimmy. The difference between non-existence and existence. I mean, between zero and one, there is nothing. But right. Between nothing and something. And because the difference between zero and one is a difference between nothing and something. That's why one reason we don't believe in... Uh, Evolution, Darwin, Darwinistic evolutionist, because that's what it basically is saying. You got something from nothing. That's impossible. It takes God. He calleth those things which be not as though they were. So, that you see that you see the relationship between that and what we're talking about. The difference between zero and one is greater than the difference between one and any other number. Explain that to me. Uh, April. Are you still there? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's what Jimmy said, right? Exactly. Between nothing and something. Yeah. The difference. The difference between. No, uh, what did we say about omnipotence? This was about, what, seven, six or seven sermons back. Omnipotence in Scripture is always a creative act, an act of creation. See, because it, it might take a lot of power to perform some kind of task that you want to perform. But uh, it takes a creative act. Uh, it takes omnipotence to perform an act of creation because creation is from something to nothing. That's what we're dealing with, with the antithesis. Uh, and the major antithesis in, is, in Scripture is justification by faith as opposed to what? 
Yeah. Justification by works. Yeah. And there's no, look at Romans 11, 6. Read that. Mary Jane, read that. Romans 11, 6. Okay, hold on. Romans, Romans six, what? 11, verse 6. Seven. And if by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. You see that? That's the antithesis. If it's grace, then it's not works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. If it's works, it's not grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. You cannot do what? What are we talking about, Ellen? Uh, don't know. I'm not following you there. You cannot. You cannot mix the two. Okay. If your concept of salvation is 99% grace and 1% works, what it in reality is is 100% works and 0% grace. You cannot add works to grace. All right, so in this verse, we're dealing with yet another one. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a servant and one by a free woman. But he which was of the servant was born after the flesh. And he which was of the free woman was born after the promise. So you have two kinds of people in the world, according to Galatians 4.22. Those who are born after the flesh and those who are born after the promise. In other words, you have, what's the two words for those people groups? You have the elect and you have the reprobate. And here's a good principle to keep in mind. If you look up uh, um, Calvin's Institutes, uh, book 3, chapter 24 and section 12, here's what Calvin says, the very first thing. He says this. He says that God's dealing with any given person are determined, God's dealings with any given person are determined by the purpose for which he created that person. If he created the person an object of wrath, then, he, then all of his dealings with him are determined by that. If he created a person to be an object of a vessel of mercy, then all of his dealings, that's, that's where you get Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. But there's a flip side of Romans 8, 28. Kenny, you know what I mean by that? All things no, no, work together. Not right off okay, Jeff, what? All things work together for bad for those who are uh, reprobate. Right. Uh, so we can say, with respect to the elect, all things, what an encouragement that is to every single one of us. All things, even the bad things, work together for our final glorification in heaven. With respect to the reprobate, however, all things, even the good things, work together for his final or toward his final destruction. That's what we have right here. See, one uh, child was born after the flesh, and he which was born of the free woman was born after the promise. And, co and so uh, Luther continues, as if he said, Ye forsake grace, faith, and Christ, and turn back again to the law. Uh, notice once again, for uh, Mary Jane's sake, we, we've been dealing with, in the book of Galatians, the problem with the Galatians is they were tempted by the Judaizers to go back into works thinking in their heads, in their minds. The battle that we fight as Christians takes place up here. The we our weapons are... Of our, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. The war takes place up here. As if he said, you forsake grace, faith in Christ and turn back again to the law. You will be under the law and become wise through it. Therefore, I will talk with you of the law. I pray you consider the law diligently 
he shall find that Abraham had two sons, Ishmael by Hagar and Isaac by Sarah. They were both the true sons of Abraham. Ishmael was as well the true son of Abraham as Isaac was. For both came of one father, of one flesh, and of one seed. What was then the difference? This make it not the difference, saith Paul, that the mother of one was free and the, and the other bond, albeit it pertaineth to the allegory. This is, this is really superb insight. You, have to, you read Luther, you've got to meditate on it. It seems to be saying that the difference was what? Jimmy. The mother's, the stat, stature of the mother. One was a free woman and one was a slave. Right, but Luther says, Luther says that wasn't the difference. Right? That, isn't that what he's saying? Which, what was in the difference? This make it not the difference, saith Paul, that the mother of the one was free and the other was bond. Albeit it pertained to the allegory. But that Ishmael, which was born of the bondwoman, was born after the flesh. That is to say, without the promise in the word of God. But Isaac was not only born of the free woman, but also according to the promise. Um, we're not going to get we're, we're not going to get as far as I thought we were today because this is just I mean this is hammering home some really important points. This tells us our purpose for evangelism. Is it coming clear? Is it is it coming into focus? You don't go. You don't evangelize somebody. You don't proclaim the gospel to somebody. Uh, thinking what, Jimmy? Thinking we can change them, or the, I mean, the stats are changes by their fear. It's like they are either elect or reprobate. Right. He's this person. Whoever you're talking to, this person, you have to remind yourself: this person was either born after the flesh or born after the promise. If he was born after the flesh, guess what? You're not going to do. You're not going to persuade him to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's not going to happen. Uh, and if you don't realize this, what will you do? What will you, not, not what might you do, you will compromise the gospel for the sake of a decision. See, I've lived in, in an age where the most popular, uh, the most popular evangelist in the 20th century uh, did this one thing. What did he do? He didn't understand that. And so he compromised the gospel for the sake of decisions. In fact, he had a magazine. What was the name of his magazine? Gary, do you remember? Decision. Decision magazine. Because he compromised the gospel for decisions. And interestingly enough, the most influential, the most popular evangelist of the 20th century uh, wrote the stupidest book that's ever been written on the face of the earth. What was the name of it? How to Be Born Again. <laughs> if it weren't so serious, it'd be the funniest thing in the universe, right? How to Be Born Again. Lazarus. Listen up, Lazarus. Here's one. I'm going to tell you how to come out of that grave. Could anything be any more ridiculous than that? So, this is what we're dealing with here. Uh, Isaac was not only born of the free woman, but also according to the promise. What then? Yet was Isaac notwithstanding as well born of the seed of Abraham as Ishmael was. I grant that they were both the children of one father, and yet notwithstanding there is a difference. For although Isaac was born of the flesh, yet the promise an appointment of God went before. None observed this difference, but only Paul, which he gathered out of the text of Genesis after this manner. So we're going to stop right there because we, we want to get into the catechism. Give me that pen. Uh, so what's he saying right there? Paul, where did Paul get this analogy? Kenny. Old Testament. Yeah, was it there? Did he make it up or did he just happen to have a more fertile imagination than most people and he made it up? Or did, was it really there? No, 
No, of course it was there. But it turned out to be the inspired word of God. All right. And Paul's words are the inspired word of God. Second, uh, Second Peter 3.16 tells us that. So, um, which is also another thing we need to keep in mind. There's a lot more in Scripture than you've ever seen. And so, before you read the Bible, what do you need to do every time? Gary. Pray. <laughs> right. Because our tendency is to lean on our own understanding, is it not? Our tendency is to read things into Scripture rather than reading out of Scripture that which is there. But we haven't seen to this point. So um, we'll leave it at that. We'll pick up on that, Lord willing, next week. But what we can get is that these two sons, uh, Isaac, both of them were born of Abraham. They were Abraham's seed. And yet, let me, let me just point out one other thing before we leave. We'll probably get back to it. I want you to, that to marinate in your minds until next week. Notice that if you've got the Luther's text in front of you, does he criticize Sarah severely? I mean, think, about, think of how you could come down hard on Sarah. Why, Ellen? How could you come down hard on Sarah? Because she took matters into her own hands. Right. But does Luther come down hard on Sarah? No. No. Why? Because there's a sense in which what Sarah did um, was godly thinking, as, as bad as that sounds on the surface. But let's, let's take the example of Jonah. All right? What happened with Jonah? God told him to go to Nineveh and to proclaim to the Ninevites the gospel. And what did he do? Did he do that? Jimmy? No, no. No. He went, he went the opposite direction. But from a certain perspective, he had a spiritual reason for doing so. Think about that. We're not... We're not belittling his or minimizing his sin. His sin was just as great as the scripture tells us. And Sarah's uh, taking matters into her own hands, as Ellen was just telling us, was, was, was sin. Clear sin. But why was Jonah reluctant to obey God? Kenny, you remember, you got the book. The Ninevites. Huh? Well, one, one reason was he knew God was merciful and he, he was afraid God would forgive him and he didn't want the people forgiven. But, but you just said he, he knew God was merciful so then he would want them to be forgiven. Jonah didn't want them to be forgiven. Right, but it wasn't because he knew God was merciful. Merciful, and mercy and forgiveness are one and the same. He knew that, try to put yourself in this, but this is Old Testament stuff, people. He knew that the, the Israelites were the people of God, not the Ninevites, right? They were the Gentiles. So he had a reason, uh, but what was he doing? He was leaning on his own understanding, and that is exactly what Sarah was doing. So we'll pick up on that, Lord willing, next week. But, uh, I have one question when it, uh, pertaining to this. Uh, your story, before you leave, the two bonds, the, the uh, free and the bond. Yeah. And, and it says, so what, what, what do we conclude, if anything, because it, it is a problem for your own understanding for some people, of uh, the, the angel coming from God and miraculously uh, sparing the bondwoman's life in Ishmael. So do we, we conclude those acts were done out of the hatred of God for those people, for their uh, for their for their finished destruction, or, or what's your take on that? How, how do you explain well, we're that? Well, we're good. We're, that, that's, that's, a, that's a good question, and it's a worthy question, but it's, it's a rabbit trail as far as what we're concerning here, we're, we're concerned about here. So maybe we can consider that later on, but uh, we want to limit it to the, just like the parables in the New Testament. They, they're designed to teach one specific truth, and so... It's best that we stay right on that.
But anyway, we're going to get to that. Maybe we can uh, address that next week. But I want us to get, I want us to get into the uh, the catechism. We're on. What question were you on this week, Jimmy? Forty-one. Yeah, forty-one. And uh, just by way of review, how did we get to forty-one? We got to forty-one through forty. <laughs> <laughs> for those of us in Rio Linda um, so but what we're dealing with here is a continuation of the questions it's a shorter catechism and in a few minutes we're going to be dealing with the, with the children because your children get this in your head your children are the future of the church. Just believe it. Just put it, just put it in your head. Believe it. It's the truth. Your children. Look at... Um, uh, what is it? Matthew does... Uh, Matthew... Well, I'm, draw, I'm drawing a blank. Um, the scripture that says that your... That, that, that if one parent in the household is a Christian, then your only one parent in the household is a Christian. Then your children are holy. Now, <clears throat> the scripture doesn't say that every every child of a Christian parent is an elect child, but they are holy, meaning what? They belong to the covenant. We are the people of God. And so... Uh, we, I frequently say that the, the pronoun that the Baptists use is second person singular. You, 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 you. Johnny, you need to make your decision for Jesus. Johnny, have you repented of your sins yet? Uh, Etc. But the biblical position is the first person plural pronoun. We believe because we are the people of God. 1 uh, Corinthians 7, 14. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 714. Let's look at it for real quickly. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. Right. Is that the one? That's the That's one. And the children are holy because, uh, and, and once again, it's not necessarily saying that every one of your children is going to end up being a Christian. But they are holy because um, they belong to the visible church. And so God saves his people in the line of continued generations. That's the way he's always done it. There is no clean break between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's one Bible. That's why it's called. It's, it's, it's B-I-B-L-E on the front. It's not B-I-B-L-E-S. Uh, it's one Bible. It's one message. Uh, there is no distinction between Israel in the Old Testament and the church in the New Testament. They are one and the same. Uh, Malachi 3.6 says, I am the Lord, I change not. God's method of saving His people is the same always in the line of continued generations. I mean, just, just imagine for a second that this was never taught in the scriptures or that you didn't know it was taught in the scriptures. This is the most logical thing imaginable. You're going, out, okay, what's the alternative? All right, God saves his people through crusade evangelism or God, uh, God saves his people through open air preaching. So you're going to go to the Super Bowl. And you're going to preach the gospel to people that might not even understand English, which I'd say 90% of Caucasians in America have very little understanding of English. That's how bad the public education is. He's been raised in a pagan home. He can hardly speak English. And you're going to persuade this person to believe the gospel. Contrast that with a child. We're talking now, we're not even talking about the clear declarations of Scripture. A child is raised in a home in which the Bible is constantly read every day uh, and explained. 
And line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept. Which is the logical method that God would use to save his people? That's the way it works. So, what? So, do you say that uh, Abraham then, uh, being a Gentile, would, 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 the, would all the new Gentiles getting saved in the book of Acts that didn't apparently come from any generation, would they be coming from, from uh, saved people, saved Gentiles in the Old Testament, or do we conclude that Abraham was their father and, and he would have been the, they would have been a continued generation from him? Well, that's why they you need... Been, that's why you need to hang in there with the shorter catechism because we're going to get to that in baptism. To whom is baptism to be administered? Baptism is not to be administered to any that are out of the visible church till they confess their faith in Christ and obedience to Him. But the infants of such as are members of the visible church are to be baptized. You don't baptize the infants of heathen. Uh, you baptize the heathen when he comes to an understanding and belief in the gospel. Because he's outside the church. Once he comes into the church through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he's baptized. But you don't take the baptism of a heathen and superimpose a biblical baptism on that one um, uh, phenomenon. You understand what I'm saying? That's what the Baptists do. Where did the, where did the Bible talk about baptizing babies? Unbelievable. Well, here, here's what I don't understand. Help me understand. Here's what I can't understand about the continuous generation thing. When, when I see the Gentiles getting saved, I'm always I'm saying where where are their ancestors that were saved? Do we, do we need? Do we just? Uh, do we just? Know Kenny, that? when they come in, they might not they might not have any ancestors that are saved. But when they come in, when they clearly believe the gospel. Uh, as Naaman the Syrian or people like that, when they clearly believe the God, they're in. And now they're, the, the covenant begins with them. And now their descendants uh, are holy. Their children are holy. Uh, whether or not they end up being saved. That's the way it works. So anyway. But it, look, um, it looks like God saves two ways then. To me, it looks like he saves continued generations, and then it looks like he starts a brand new thing with somebody that never had one saved ancestor. Well, then, how did the gospel? How did the gospel ever? How come? How come we're Christians as Gentiles? You see that? The G, that's why you have to go back to the beginning. What was the purpose of the gospel going to the Jews in the first place? So that the Gentiles would be become believers through them. Read Romans 11, the olive tree, right? The branches are grafted into the olive tree. See that? They weren't there before, but once they're grafted into the tree, guess where they are, Ellie? Huh? Once they're in the tree. That's so difficult to understand, isn't it? And once they're in the tree, guess where they are? They're in the tree. They're in the tree as if they were never outside of the tree. That's what happens when a complete heathen believes the gospel. He's in the tree just as if he, he was always in the tree. And now, his descendants. That's the way it works. So anyway, but we're not dealing with that specifically now. Uh, we're going back to the uh, how we got to question 41. Uh, we started with, well, we talked about uh, question 3. What is that? What do the script what do the scriptures principally teach, Jimmy? The scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duties God requires of him. Okay, what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. Guess what? This is once again. There is nothing outside of Jesus Christ, nothing is logical. Everything is total, complete, and utter confusion. See, all these people coming down on, on, oh, look at what's happening. Now, we're aborting babies after they're born. There's no such thing as, as an abortion after a baby's born. Suppose he's 45 years old. If you kill him, is that an abortion? 
but they're all up in arms about this stuff. But it's total, complete, and utter confusion no matter what these people say. The only logic which is ever obtained is the logic that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. And what's the Greek word for word? Logos. That's where we get logic from. Nothing makes sense outside of Christ. Nothing. Christ is the logic of God. And that's why these Calvinists, they want to depart from the bib clear biblical systematic teaching of the Bible. They're, way, they're just as far off as a heathen. So, anyway, I say that to say this. What do the scriptures principally teach? What does principally mean? Gary. Primarily. Exactly. Perfect synonym. What do the scriptures primarily teach? Do they teach there was a man named Abraham? Yes. Do they, preach, do they teach there was a flood, a worldwide flood? Yes. Do they teach there was a man named Paul? Yes. Do they teach that uh, Paul left his cloak at Troas? Yes. What do the scriptures primarily teach? And what's the answer? What is it, Kenny? The gospel. There, so, question three. I'm teaching you how to think. Question three in the shorter catechism has to mean the gospel. Does it say gospel in that question, Ellen? Do you see it? G-O-S-P-E-L. Is that there? No, that particular word, no. No, the concept has to be there. The scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. That's the gospel. Because the scriptures principally teach the gospel. We said this over and over in different messages. Um, everything in the scripture is significant. Every verse in the scripture is significant. Otherwise, guess what? God would have left it out. But, Every verse in Scripture is only significant insofar as it relates to the major teaching of the Scripture. Does that make sense, Jim? Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking of a verse that said, uh, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Okay. Christ, the, you know, the gospel. What we're dealing with here is that has to mean the God. What do the Scriptures Principle. You think these guys, 107 of the, of the uh, most spiritual men who've ever lived, you think they didn't understand what the principal teaching of the scripture was? What do the scriptures principally teach? What man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires? That's the gospel. And you need to see how it's the gospel. You need to be able to explain to other people how that's the gospel. What man is to believe concerning God? Once you find, and what's the next question? What is God? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, and his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness. And that drives you to total despair. Because if God is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, in his being, in his wisdom, in his power, in his holiness, in his justice, in his goodness, in his and in his truth, you're damned. See that? What man is to believe concerning God? And what duty God requires of man? If I were to select one statement that is perhaps outside of Scripture, I could uh, select scriptural statements, but outside of Scripture that is perhaps the clearest summary of what we've been preaching about for the past year, I couldn't select one that's clearer than that. Because We've been preaching from Isaiah 52, 7. Say unto Zion, thy God reigneth. And what do we say? How does God reign? What is his scepter? Gary. Gospel. Gary. The truth of 
His law. His law. He reigns through his law. And since he reigns through his law, we discover that Adam, when Adam fell, he fell into two different states. He fell into an objective state of guilt and he fell into a subjective state, the guilt of sin, and he fell into a subjective state of the dominion of sin. A subjective state of dominion, objective state of guilt. A person is born guilty. Well, I don't feel guilty. It does, guilt has nothing to do with feelings whatsoever. That's what we were talking about recently. Prisons used to be called prisons. Now they're called correctional institutions. See, because people are so stupid, they don't understand that. Uh, and objective, you're guilty. With, it doesn't matter how you feel. And number two, they're not going to correct you. <laughs> Those jails, they don't, they've never corrected anybody. Uh, uh, in God's sight, a person is guilty before he commits any transgressions whatsoever. Because he's guilty in Adam. And secondly, he fell into an, a subjective state of the dominion of sin. What do we mean by the dominion of sin? Kenny? Maybe it's the only thing he can do. Exactly. He's controlled by sin. Huh? Augustine put it well. He said, man at the fall, uh, his relationship to sin became unable not to sin. Everything he does is sin because he does nothing with a view to the glory of God. It's all self-glorification. So, see what I'm saying? The scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God. And once you realize who God is, what do you realize about yourself? Andrew, are you there? Maybe Kimberly's there. Uh, Jimmy, once you realize who God is, what do you realize about yourself? You're guilty. You're guilty before God. And then secondly, you realize that you subjectively speaking can do nothing which God commands you to do. And you learn that through the law. So that's what we're talking about. What do the scriptures principally teach? We're talking about the law. What man is to believe concerning God? What are the Ten Commandments? How are the Ten Commandments di divided? Gary. Into two sections, right? The two tables of the law. When Moses went up to Sinai, he came down, he could have come down with one table, but he came down with two. Why? One was our responsibility to God and other our responsibility to man. Does that remind you of question three of the Shorter Catechism? Yes, it does. There it is. Huh? What man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. Once you find out who God is, it drives you to total, complete, and utter despair. And then, the law not only drives us to despair... But God's ruling by his law, subjectively speaking, and we're talking about the elect sinner, the sinner who fell in Adam but has been elected from the foundation of the world. When he is driven to total despair and seeing that he is guilty, at one and the same time, he's driven to see his only hope. And he's driven by the law, as in the Lord Jesus Christ and God. And that realization is called what? Jimmy. Regeneration. Exactly. Regeneration is understanding. It's understanding. See, you talk to any non-Christian you've ever talked to that doesn't end up getting saved. He doesn't believe you. He doesn't believe that he's as bad as he can possibly be. No, no, he'll never believe that. He believes he's basically, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done some bad stuff. I'm, I've, in fact, I've done a lot of bad stuff. But I'm basically a good person. Every single one of them believes that. I'm basically a good... Well, then you're not ready to be saved because you're not lost in your own mind. The Holy Spirit causes him to realize through the law his objective guilt. That's regeneration. And then one at the same time, he realizes his only hope is in the perfect righteousness of Christ because he's got no righteousness. 
And he has to have righteousness to stand before an infinitely holy God. And that realization reconciles him to the law of God. And so God reigns by his law in causing us to obey it. Causing us to obey it. What does the Baptist tell you, Kenny? That you're caused to obey the law of God? Yeah. We brought it out. And it's always an, it's an opportunity for you to do something, right? The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? Time after time, he's waited out in the cold and waiting for you to open that door uh, to see if you're willing to open the door. Oh, how he wants to come in. Uh, that Jesus is an object of pity, not of praise, but not the Jesus of the Bible. He comes and actually procures the salvation of God's people. And so, what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. That's how we got from question three all the way up to, which was it, 39? What is, what is the duty God requires of man? So we dealt with God first and then we got to man's duty, the second table of the law. Uh, obedience to his revealed will. What did God at first reveal? Demand for the rule of his obedience. And what's the answer? Um, Jimmy, what did God at first reveal to man for the rule of his obedience? The rule which God at first revealed to man was for obedience of the moral law. Was, his more, was the moral law. Um, so in the last week we talked about the three different kinds of law in scripture. Law is divide, divided into ceremonial law. Uh, and what, what was that? Jeff, what's the ceremonial law? Uh, well, those would, be, uh, those would be all the laws uh, required by the Jews, like the washings and the... Uh, um, but it's a sacrificial, uh, yeah, the sacrificial system. The whole sacrificial system is a ceremonial. And then the civil law was the law pertaining to Israel as a nation. And then the moral law, which is found in the Ten Commandments. That's what we're dealing with now. Uh, you got the rule of God first revealed to man was the moral law. Uh, and then... We're in question um, 41. 41. And read that, yeah. What is the, uh, what is the moral law summarily comprehended? And what's the answer? The uh, moral law is summarily comprehended in the Ten Commandments. All right. So, um, we talked about uh, going back to our review that uh, the, wherein consists the sinfulness of that estate wherein a man fell. And what's the answer to that, Jimmy? The sinfulness of the sinfulness and to which man fell consists in the guilt of Adam's first sin. Mm -hmm. You got it? The guilt of Adam's first sin, the want of original righteousness, and the corruption of his whole nature, which is commonly called original sin, together with all actual transgressions, which proceed from it. And what does that tell us? That man is as bad as he can possibly be. What's the first thing a Calvinist tells you when he says he believes, he says he believes in total depravity. What's the first? Have you ever noticed it, uh, Mary Jane? What's the first thing they say about total depravity? Have you noticed? Uh, what, that they're not as bad as they can? Exactly. The very first thing they say. Uh, which means they're not confessional. Uh, we're inconsistent. Listen, listen carefully. 
The sinfulness of that estate wherein a man fell consists in the guilt of Adam's first sin. The want of original righteousness. He's no longer upright. And the corruption of his whole nature. Uh, and the corruption of which is commonly called together with all actual transgressions which proceed from a totally corrupt nature. Every actual transgression proceeds from a totally corrupt nature. And then what does that mean, Andrew? Huh? Your mic's not on, buddy. It, it means that every actual transgression that he commits are as bad as they can be. Exactly. Now... It might not appear to it on the surface and it might, it might not appear to be as bad as it can be. But what does the scriptures... And God saw that the wickedness of Genesis 6, 5. God saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Can you get any worse than that, Kenny? So that's the biblical position. And then we got, uh, that's question 18. When we get to 20, did God leave all mankind to perish in the estate of sin and misery? And what's the answer, Andrew? God having an of his misery pleasure from all the time to the election, son of the devil after an hour, to enter into a covenant of grace, to deliver the man of the estate of sin and misery, and to bring them into a state of salvation by the redeemer. Okay, now we get to question 20. The condition of man is as, as bad as he can possibly be. Now, if it weren't as bad as he could possibly be, then what would, uh, then, then what would transpire? Jimmy, if man were not as bad as he could be. If man was not as bad as he could be, then Christ died in vain. I mean, and, we're dealing with question 20. Did God leave all mankind to perish? The very fact that you have question 20 means this. God could have left mankind to perish in his estate of sin and misery. And what would have happened? Kenny? He would have perished. He would have perished. Why? Because he can't do anything to extricate himself from that position. He is as bad as he can possibly be. He's dead. In trespasses and sin. So, did God leave all mankind to perish in this day? No. God having out of his mere good pleasure from all eternity elected so. So the work of the Father is that he has elected some from the foundation of the world to deliver them out of this state of being as bad as you can possibly be. And then beginning with what? I got a question. Do the actual transgressions that proceed from the original sin, are they as bad as they could be? Of course. How could they not be? How could they not be? Give me a scenario. If an apple tree, if, if it's conceivable, if an apple tree is as unapple-like as possible, say that again. If an apple tree is as un does the does the scripture ever refer to sinners as ungodly? Yes or no? Yeah. 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 Well, well, here, here's what, here's We're not, no, wait, 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 wait. I'm answering your question. If it's conceivable yeah. to have a, an apple tree which is as unapple as possible, completely unapple like, okay, uh -huh. and it bears yeah. fruit. Okay, what will that fruit how will that resemble an apple, Andrew? What will be the relationship between that fruit and an apple? If the apple tree is as unapple-like as possible. The same relationship in between light and darkness. There you go. It has no relationship to an apple whatsoever. Because it is totally unapple. The root that produces the fruit 
is totally unapple like And so it is with man. And so that's what the confession says. But, but All actual transgressions says. proceed from a nature which is totally that, and completely that, corrupt. That's the presumption you're making, that, that the actual transgressions that proceed uh, are as bad as they could be. Now, it's, it's clearly stated in the confession that by his nature, he's as bad as he could be. But nowhere in the confession do I see it saying that the actual transgressions that proceed are as bad as they can be. In fact, on the contrary, on page 123 of the confessions, it says, works done by unregenerate men, although for the matter of them, they may be things which God commands and of good use. Both Stop right God there. Stop right there. On the matter of them. Things with God's commands. A five-year-old kid, when his mother tells him to close the door, and he closes the door, did he do something that is not regenerate? Did he do something that is acceptable in the sight of God? But that, but those, hey, that hey I'm talking now, Jeff. I'm explaining something to you that you do not understand. Okay? He, he, his obedience seems to be acceptable. But in the sight of God, no way, Jose, boy. Even though, apparently, he obeyed his mother. That's what it's talking about. So, why does but, the last statement of the... Uh, let, let, me fin let me finish, okay? Why does the last statement say, and yet their neglect of them is more sinful and displeasing to God? Evidently, their actions can be either more sinful or less sinful. So is their behavior as bad as it could be? If what what did I just say, Jeff? What did I just say? Is it as bad as it can be? <laughs> well, you're not getting that from the confession. Well, okay. Utterly indisposed to all good. Utterly disabled yeah. to all good. Made yeah, up, Okay, I, let me finish. Let me finish. Just, just Utterly... Hey, Jeff. All these actual transgressions proceed. But you're making the quantum leap that the actual transgressions are as bad as they could be. That's not stated in the confession. Okay. Uh, we're in because the symbolism that the guilt of Adam's first sin, the one of original righteousness, and the corruption of his whole nature. The corruption of his entire nature, which is commonly called sure. Together with. A, sure. Hey, Jeff, I'll give sure. you a chance to talk, but you're not going to interrupt me. Okay. Utterly, uh, see, uh, the sinfulness of that statement because it's the guilt of Adam's first sin, the one of original righteousness, and the corruption of his, the corruption of his whole nature, which is commonly called okay. together with all actual transgressions, which yeah. proceed from what? From the nature. All it's right. not arguable. I'm just saying that the confession itself doesn't say that the actual transgressions are completely. Hey, Kenny, Kenny, what do the actual transgressions proceed from? Does it say? Nature. Kenny, you're not, your name isn't that. Kenny. Oh, really? Your name isn't Kenny. Kenny, what do they proceed from? Does it say? When well, I was so engrossed, I, I'm listening. I, I wouldn't pay much attention to the exact one. Well, look, so, at, look at question 18 of the Shorter Catechism. Does it say what the actual transgressions proceed from? Yes or no? Yeah. <laughs> Kenny, yes or no? And the corruption of his whole nature, which is commonly called original sin. Together with, together with, all, together with all actual transgressions which proceed from it. Proceed from what? The nature. What kind of a nature? Totally depraved. Right. So, if they proceed from a totally corrupt nature, what percentage of those actual transgressions is good, Kenny? What percentage? None. Huh? Zero. That's all we're saying. So, anyway. Uh, so, we get to the Father. He elected some. 
He got to leave all mankind to perish in the state of sin and read God having out of his mere good pleasure from all eternity. He elected some to everlasting life. And then that's question 20. Then beginning with question 21, that deals with God the Son. And then what does God the Son do? He redeems those that the Father chose. He comes and procures the salvation of all that the Father chose and makes, what do we say? The Son makes God's election consistent with what, Andrew? His justice. All right. And then beginning with question 29, uh, we start with a work of the Spirit. Read that, Andrew, or, or recite it. Question 29 says what? How are we made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ? We are made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ by the effectual application of it to us by His Holy Spirit. Okay, so the Father chooses some uh, to deliver them out of this estate of sin and misery. And then the Son comes and redeems them, procures our salvation, and the Spirit applies the election of the Father and the redemption of the Son to the same people. Uh, factual application of it to how does the Spirit apply to us the redemption purchased by Christ? The Spirit applies to us the redemption purchased by, by working faith in us. And what does that do? Jimmy? For us to believe the gospel. Right. Unites us to Christ's righteousness. And then. Uh, we, that was question um, 30. Now we're up to 41. We're still dealing with what the Holy Spirit does. And so our, be our obedience uh, is, does our obedience come from us? Andrew. No, it comes from the Holy Spirit. There it is. So we're still dealing with the work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit comes and regenerates us. Uh, and what is regeneration? Uh, Larry, you remember? No, sir. Okay. Regeneration is understanding. Uh, let's look at uh, Ephesians 4, verse 18. Kenny, read that real fast. What Doing of the Spirit. There you go. Genesis, uh, excuse me, Ephesians 4 18. Kenny. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Okay. Does it say they were alienated from the life of God? Yeah. All right. If you're alienated from life, this is really complicated, so you'll put your thinking caps on. If you're alienated from life, what does that mean about you, Andrew? It means that you're dead. That you're dead. And does it tell us why they were alienated? Because they were what? We have to have that. Andrew. Ephesians 4.18. They were alienated through what? Through the ignorance. Ignorance. So, once a person is no longer ignorant, then what does that mean, Larry? You can figure that out, right? Texas boy can figure that out. <laughs> then there's life. There you go. I told you it was complicated. So, if you're alienated from life, by ignorance, and you suddenly become not ignorant anymore, then you have life. That's the essence of it. Compare that with a verse you've heard a, a, a thousand times if you've gone to church as many times as I have. Except a man be born of God, he cannot... What's the next word? Anybody? See. 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 So... Regeneration in Scripture is equated with understanding. What is uh, Romans? Uh, it's not Romans. Uh, Romans chapter 
was uh, uh, First Corinthians, Second um, Corinthians four four. Andrew, look that up real fast. Second Corinthians four four. Blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, um, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You see that? The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. So, unregenerate man, he has no life because he has no understanding. That's another, we were talking about antithesis. Okay? Understanding and ignorance. Is that an example of antithesis? Larry, yes or no? Yes. There you go. So a person either understands or is he ignorant? If he's ignorant, he has zero understanding. So, when a person is born, except a man be born again, he cannot. See the kingdom of God. He has. You talk. So you're proclaiming the gospel to a person, and how much of it does he understand, Andrew? Um, it's not safe. He, understand, he understands zero uh, percent of it, unless the Holy Spirit gives him a new heart. There it is, right there. And as soon as he's regenerated, then what? He understands. He understands. He understands. The salvation of Second Corinthians four six. Turn to that. Second Jimmy, I mean uh, Kenny. Second Corinthians four six. Read that. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. What? You say Kenny or Jimmy? Kenny. Has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Do you see the word knowledge in there somewhere? Yeah. Okay, so as soon as a person is regenerated, he has something they didn't have before. And what is that? Kenny? Knowledge. Does it tell us what kind of knowledge? Knowledge of what? Of God. No. It says knowledge of what? Glory the glory of God. So for the first time, he sees, he understands that it is God and God alone who's to be glorified. Before that, what did he believe? Larry, who's to be glorified? Before that, it's himself. There you go. So a little kid, when he's born... He, love, he loves his mama. Doesn't he love his mama? No, he hates his mother. How dare you say? Well, the scripture says he does. The only use he has for his mother is to give him milk, change his diaper, give him everything he wants. Um, He's a viper in diapers. Yeah, there you go. So, uh, <laughs> and, so to give it, and when he regenerate. He, so you just he, bear it out. And I'll, if you need me, I'll help. Just, hey, Jeff, mute your right. mic. Your mic is still on. Mute it. Oh, I'm sorry. Click the mute button. Yeah. Right. So, Hang on. that's what happens. He realizes for the first time that it is God and not himself who's to be glorified. And so what is he immediately interested in? Gary, you follow me? What is he interested in? If he sees for the first time, it is God and not himself that is to be glorified. He wants to know something. And what is that? Well, he wants to see the gospel. He, he wants to see it. Well, we go back to question three. Uh, scripture turns on, what man is to believe concerning God? What duty God requires of man? He wants to know what God wants him to do. Since now he believes it is God to be glorified and not himself. How can I glorify God? And the answer is through obedience to the moral law. And we're going to get into the details of that probably next week. 
but I just wanted to go through some. Uh, Mary Jane, did you understand that summary there? Uh, let me know if you got. Ask me a question. <laughs> Turn your mic on. Your mic is still muted. Mary Jane, can you hear me? Yes, I'm a question now. Okay. What's that? I missed your question. I said, <laughs> I said, do you have any questions? I tried to summarize how we got to question 41 uh, in the catechism. No, but I was going to remind you of the question that we touched on Facebook about, um, do you remember the question? No. <laughs> I'm 64 years old. Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? It just left my mind too, so I'm not even 40 yet, and I already forgot. Uh, question, uh, Facebook. Uh, the question that we're on as a family, we're on, let me just go back to the one we're on, and then it'll jog my memory. Fourth petition, give us our daily bread. Oh, I got you. Okay. That refutes common grace, and here's how. It says that of God's free gift, look at the answer, we may receive a competent portion of the good things of this life and two things enjoy his blessing with them so when you pray to God give us this day our daily bread according to the Westminster divines you are asking him two things to give you a competent portion of the good things of this life and secondly that we might be blessed by them what they're saying is it is possible, in fact, for the most part, this is what happens, uh, to receive good things in this life and not be blessed by those good things, but be cursed by those good things. Does that make sense? Look, look up, yes. look up okay. Psalm 92, verse 7. Psalm 92, verse 7, and read that. Psalm 92, the Psalm, the 92nd Psalm, verse 7. Read that. What catechism are you on? Well, Thank you. <laughs> 90, 92, verse 7? Yeah. When the wicked spring as the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. Okay. Did they receive a competent portion of good things? Yes, so he provides for, I guess that's, they go back to that verse where he reigns upon the wicked and the righteous. He gives rain and gives a general blessing to all his creation. No, 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 but, but, but to pay close attention to what we're saying. Uh, what does Psalm 92, 7 say? When the wicked spring is the grass, he causes this, these people to be rich. And when all the workers of iniquity do flourish. They have more than, more than a competent portion of good things. But he gives these people good things for the purpose of destroying them. They're not blessings. They're curses to them. In fact, you've got three kids. Can you think of a better way to destroy your kids than giving, him, giving them every single thing they ever want? Can you think of a better way to destroy them than that? I can't. No. There it is. So, what they're saying in question 104, uh, uh, that of God's free gift we may receive a competent portion of the good things of this life and be blessed by these things because it's possible to receive good things from the hand of God and receive them as a curse and not a blessing. But the concept of common grace teaches this that these good things are in and of themselves blessings. You got that, Andrew? 
Yeah. Um, in other words, blessings. The blessing of God is not everything. Right. Good point. The bl God's blessing is not in those things themselves, but it is in the attitude of the God who gives those things. If he gives them to the elect, he gives those things to the elect with a view to causing those things to work out his eternal salvation. If he gives them to the reprobate, they're not blessings. They're curses. But the, the Calvinists in our generation, uh, their concept of common grace says that these things are in and of themselves blessings. But the uh, Catechism says no. In fact, uh, that question in the 10, question 104 is the, the saint asking God uh, to bless him with these good things. All right, um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for thy word. We thank you for the clarity of it. We thank thee that thou hast saved us and call us within holy calling, not according to our works, but according to thine own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, that the Father and the Son and the Spirit are all involved in our salvation, and so therefore it is an everlasting salvation, and this is our blessed hope. In the name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen.